So should we welcome Father Dominic? It's yes. great to have you with us. Thanks very much. <laughs> Just a, a very quick introduction. But Father Dominic has driven over from Yorkshire to be with us to celebrate Mass this morning. Father Martin, of course, was supposed to give the talk, but he, he, was, he was ill. And Father Dominic gave his testimony, the story of his faith to his parish last Sunday. And I listened to this on Tuesday and just rang him straight away to see if he was free to come over and share that testimony with us. Um, because uh, Dominic, Father Dominic speaks with passion and uh, just genuine, this uh, faith journey. And uh, his homily was 21 minutes. <laughs> and I've tried to say, but you're 22 minutes today to speak because we're going to go into a time of adoration to conclude the day afterwards. <laughs> And uh, we've also told everyone about your brothers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and Barry. So, Harry. Yeah. <laughs> Bernadette, uh, Claire, Victoria, Rosari, Bernadette, Mary, and Veronica as well. <laughs> so, the only way he could convince me to be sure is by saying I would get into the time of Jesus. <laughs> so, I preached recently at Tyburn in London. Yeah, we had a mass declaring the new evangelization has begun in a major way in London. 40 years after JP2 called for it, been in the desert, now is the time to cross over. Okay, cross over the Jordan, take back our lands for Christ. I've declared it in Ireland, I've declared it in Yorkshire, and in London. Okay, and now, what county are we in? Cheshire. Ooh, I declare the new evangelization in Cheshire. And I, yes! <laughs> and I claim Cheshire for Christ in the holy name of Jesus and the all-powerful sign of the cross in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. It's accomplished. All we do now is see it play out. So easy. <laughs> Father, it's a spiritual authority in this place. Can you pray for me, please? Yeah. Oh God, we ask you to pour out your Holy Spirit upon your beloved Son. Let him be your instrument of light and hope and peace to your children. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you. I'm a bit wiped out because when we started Mass this morning, we had adoration before Mass. Adoration before Mass. And uh, I was thinking, how does Jesus feel today? So not how does he feel 2,000 years ago. How does Jesus feel today? Because if you're... If we're in the presence of the Blessed Sacrament, we're in the presence of Christ. So we, we are with Christ in the Eucharist, in the Holy Mysteries. We mystically enter into these things. It's not just a memory. So I was thinking, how does Jesus feel today? And then the entrance antiphon, O oh Lord, do not stay afar off. My strength make haste to help me. For I am a worm and no man, scorned by everyone, despised by the people. That's how Jesus felt today, preparing for tomorrow and the week that is to come. And then we went through the first reading, which explains why he did it, why he was willing to go through it all. And then the communion antiphon is, is, Christ was handed over to gather into one, the scattered children of God. So the Father was willing to hand him over to gather us together. Right, has the 22 minutes started yet? <laughs> <laughs> right, so I'll give my testimony, okay? So, I'm from an extraordinarily wonderful loving family of 11 children. And many people in my community had the grace to accept the church's wonderful, beautiful, life-giving teachings on the transmission of human life. Human vitae, and now we have the theology of the body, Okay. If you got it wrong in that regard, don't worry, just repent, say sorry, come into line with the church's teaching. All the church's teaching and the commandments of God are for your flourishing in this life and your deification in the next. So if you've got anything wrong, easy, repent and believe. You'll see, I've done it myself. So, wonderful family life, very happy, but we all have free will. And at about the age of 13, I chose sin as my path. I entered deeply into personal sin. 
doesn't even matter what it was. It was just sin. So, how does that happen from a holy family? St. Augustine's mum was a canonized saint, okay? And he did the same. So. so, I went into personal sin. My mind became clouded, and I entered into darkness. And if you don't have Jesus, this will happen. So, all of the anxieties, addictions, all of these things people struggle with, it's just because they don't have Jesus. And if you don't have Jesus, something will get you. Booze, drugs, gambling, women, whatever, something will get you. So, Jesus is the answer. So I went into sin. I got in some difficulties. For me, it was body image and self-hatred, the first two. So when I got to 15, I got, um, I started dabbling with some anorexia. And it progressed and got worse and worse. I got this strange thing. I looked in the mirror and literally I was getting thinner and thinner and thinner. And like a hall of mirrors, in the image I saw in that mirror was not the truth. I was, it was crazy. So I was getting thinner and thinner and thinner, and eating less and less and less. So my mum thankfully took me to a nutritionist doctor, and this was good, just be simple with people. She said, if you carry on doing what you're going to do, you're going to die. <laughs> that was a good message. So I snapped out of it. Yeah, that's not a good idea. So what did I do? What did I do? I to be in, under our lady's protection and mantle. And so I preach. And this is the symbol of the teaching office. So um, I snapped out of that and I went entirely the other way. So I didn't know the answer, didn't know Jesus. So I just went the other way. And I just binged on everything I could get hold of. Yeah? Booze and food. Two of the main ones, many of us. But booze and food were two of the easiest ones to talk about. So, that wasn't a good idea. But, I beat anorexia. Have you ever seen anyone who's beat anorexia better than me? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to get a t-shirt made. A cross and I beat anorexia. <laughs> so... Binged on everything. This is from 15. Booze, a big one. So I hit it very hard. Started going out with a gang of lads. We're from Rotherham in South Yorkshire. Um, and a tough area of Rotherham actually called Eastwood. And it's one of the most underprivileged areas in the whole of Europe, actually. And uh, so me and this gang of lads started going out. And we just hit the booze and the party scene very hard. To such an extent, by the time we were 18, so when we could legally do it, we were barred from every pub in London <laughs> that we wanted to go in. I've just realised this has been recorded. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And also the pubs in Rotherham. Hello. <laughs> Not just that, I've got to consider what I'm going to say now. Hello, <laughs> people of the world. Right. So, yeah, we got barred from all the pubs. And I was famous for speed drinking, pint downing. Okay, I'm undefeated. Nobody's ever beat me. Four pints in 12 seconds. Oh, one pint in 1.7 seconds, which is 0.1 of a second off the world record. Guinness don't do that world record anymore, because it's a bad idea. Okay? So that was my thing. And my friend, one of the guys I was knocking about with, a few of them actually, one of them was just brilliant at fighting. Okay? And he rose through the ranks of that, and he got to a stage where I thought, ooh, I've got to get out of this. Us, these guys we were encountering quite serious type of fellas so that was all a very bad idea so 18 barred from all the pubs got to 18 we were bored of that scene so it hit the clubs Sheffield and beyond our kind of scene at the time it was this is like music territory in Manchester and all that over here for us it were kind of killers and people like that and the, and the clubs as they were coming onto the scene so it was really wild, and I was high as a kite all the weekends. I led the charge, led the drinking, I was dancing on the pub tables, and literally, yeah, literally getting everybody else to follow me, doing all the stupid stuff I was doing. And I was high at the weekend, and low, very low. Well, I was low actually at the time, but then especially after the session finished, oh dear, that was just, oh, crashed. 
So high as a kite at the weekend, very low during the week. Very low during the week. So, what was going on? So I'd left God, that was the important thing. God had become, so I, I said this wrong last week, I said God had become distant from me. No. I became distant from God. I became distant from God by my choices. And he became like an abstract concept to me, an abstract concept. And I used to think, he is for you lot, okay? And my mum and my dad and the good people in the parish was like, all of you who made yourself good, who are naturally moral and good people, and if you can be like that, then you can go to church. Ridiculous. Absolutely the wrong way around. I'm really sorry to interrupt yeah. you, Father, but since I became 80, mm -hmm. God has started taking my hearing back. Ooh. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Nobody, very few people have ever told me I'm not loud enough. Come up higher, come up higher, woman. Come up higher. Now I can't see the paper. Um, so yeah, I'm getting a bit bogged down in all of this rubbish stuff. Get to the good stuff, get to the good stuff. Anyway, university, three-year hangover, an 18 grand hangover. What a waste of time in Leeds. Now, things started to get a little bit better. I went traveling to Australia, and I had some time in the wilderness. So, 22-year-old, spent a lot of time on the farms and the building sites. I'm a builder. And the best bits were living out in the bush, away from everything, with some other young people, around campfires, with a bit of guitar, drinking something called goon which is incredibly cheap white wine so you can get five liters of wine for twelve dollars anyway so we drank a lot of that but the important thing was i started to look up at the stars at night in the stunning australian night sky without any light pollution okay and it was stunning and one night i experienced something called natural contemplation natural contemplation that is when you are stunned by the transcendence and beauty of something like creation or the goodness of a child, for instance. Something beautiful, something loving, something that emphasizes being or oneness. They're called the transcendentals. By the way, um, my speciality in study is uh, spirituality. I'm a spiritual theologian trained in Rome. And my actual specialization is Eucharistic spirituality to empower the new evangelization. So it's good to be with you, which is what you're doing today. <coughs> so, natural contemplation opened me up, and it doesn't take you to the divine, but it opens doors, and then the Lord can come in. So I had some experiences of natural contemplation. I had some experiences in the wilderness, in the desert, thinking, some time and some space. What's going on? I was still incredibly unhappy. Right? I was still massively unhappy, but I had some time and space. And I came home from that and then started working in the family building firm at 22. So I've got a business degree, I've got a family firm, I'm a builder. This is life now, what do you do? Smashed at the weekend and then boring during the week, working to do it all again. When you get into that scene in a big way, some of you probably know, you keep extending the session. So for us, the weekend went until Monday night, and then we started again on Wednesdays. <laughs> yeah, Mondays and Thursday nights became big nights. Anyway, crazy. So the, ta the downtime in the middle was very short, because you want to smash that horrible feeling which arises in you. Why are you doing all this? So what am I going to do to make me happy? I still didn't know. The answer was Jesus. And I developed, but you're always searching for the truth. So I, this thing came into my mind. I developed an idol woman, right? I made woman an idol. I used to think I will meet this one perfect Catholic woman and she will make me happy. And so many people do this. And then the relationships fail because they're not happy with themselves. And you always think, oh, it's because I've not met that one, that one, that one. Endless cycle of years of these relationships. Because you've got to find interior peace first with Christ. And then you can be happy and have a true relationship with somebody. So, I made woman the idol. So what did I do? I used to keep falling head over heels in love 
with female friends who showed me kindness. Okay, that was a disaster. Nearly ruined many friendships. One of them was there at the weekend when I preached this, and we were, we were laughing with her husband. And then it really developed this idol because I thought I'd met the one. I thought I met the one. Do you know the song The Black Velvet Band? Yeah. Her eyes, they shone like diamonds. <laughs> Neck like a swan. Yeah? Black hair, Irish looking, beauty. And so I thought, this is, the, this is it, this is it. And we're close, we're very good friends, and it wasn't meant to be. It wasn't meant to be. So I crashed even more, and that idol was smashed. So the idol was smashed, and they knew it was never going to happen. She married someone else. Good friend. Uh, anyway, so then I'm 26, everything hit me like a ton of bricks. Everything hit me like a ton of bricks. The self hatred in a massive way, the depression, the loss of that last hope I had for happiness. And I just crashed in a massive way. So I went to work on the building site. After an hour of bursting into tears, I was a big tough builder. Went home the next morning, I couldn't face going to work. So I barricaded myself in my room, closed the curtains, and the only thing I got up for was to stand in the mirror and curse myself with every evil name you can imagine. Okay? So I thought other people were good. I just totally despise myself, curse myself. So there is an enemy. Who talks about the enemy a lot? Jesus and Pope Francis. Right. So there is an enemy. I call him now the slivering idiot. Okay? He's a slivering idiot. I know a holy woman, a mother of a priest, and I was once talking to her about this, and I looked at her, and I looked at her foot, and like that lady's doing now, she started doing that on the ground with her heel. Yeah? His head has been crushed. We have Mary and Jesus. We have nothing to fear. So, he was getting at me in a big way, and he made me believe a load of lies about myself. All of that was lies. So, if I can say this with all simplicity, this is true. Most people have got this problem. You can cast it out of you. If you believe, if you believe or you hear or you accept or you intuit anything about yourself that says anything other than you are good, beautiful, pure and precious in the eyes of God, it's a lie from the enemy. It's a lie from the father of lies. And you can get rid of it. I can cast it out of you, or you can do it yourself. You just say, in your own words, when you feel that and think it about yourself, get away from me. I want nothing to do with you. I love and obey my Lord Jesus Christ. And it goes. Because the darkness can't abide the light. The word of God is all-powerful. So when the darkness comes into confrontation with the all-powerful word of God and the light, it has to flee. It can't abide. So you can just do that. It's very simple. We might be here for a long time after this preaching, but if you've got any problems like that, literally you can come to me and these priests, and we will declare that over you and just cast it out by the power of the word of God. It's really simple once you wake up to it. Anyway, I didn't realise at the time, I accepted all the lies, I thought I was the most abysmal person who'd ever lived, I didn't want to live anymore, thanks be to God, because of my family and friends, I would have never done anything about it, so what was I left with? A hellish limbo for the rest of my life, that was it, what am I going to do? Turns out all this was happening during Lent, I still used to go to Mass as a cultural Catholic, and... Yeah, why don't I just tell you this? So I first discovered... Oh, this It's hard with the camera. So I first discovered the power of the Eucharist by going to Mass with crazy hangovers on a Sunday morning without the realisation that this was a problem. As an Irish Yorkshire Catholic, I thought it was good and normal to get that smashed every weekend and go to Mass and receive the Lord. 
I know now that's a really bad idea and I'd have to go to confession before I did so. You must go to confession when you're in mortal sin, okay? Before you receive the Eucharist. I didn't realize that. I was so blinded, I didn't know that was a problem. I thought it was normal life. And my first experience of the power of the Eucharist was being brought out of horrific hangovers. I never said this before in public testimony, okay? It's true. So, as, got as low as you can get, got to Good Friday, went to the church, all my family and friends were at the front, couldn't bear to be near anybody, sank to my knees at the back of the church, exactly at three o'clock. Should have the big crucifix here, yeah, there's one there. So sank to my knees and just looked at the big hanging crucifix at three o'clock, okay? Didn't have a prayer, didn't say anything. I had told one person in the world, a very dear cousin to me, I am in a bad way. She was praying, my mum and dad were praying, other people would have been praying. Just looked at the big hanging crucifix at three o'clock, and as I saw the crucifix, everything left, everything departed. After 13 years of hell and existential anguish, all the pain instantly left. When I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all people to myself. Got up, didn't know what was happening. I actually felt numb inside. There was no elation. There was no high. I remember a slight relief. A slight relief, okay? That's all the pain was gone. Went home Friday, and I felt like that all day Saturday. Totally and utterly dead. I know now, theologically, I was in the tomb. So... Went back for the Easter Vigil, church all in darkness. This time I was with my family and friends at the front. And the priest came in at the back. And I was on the front row here. And I turned around. And he came through the back door with the blessed Paschal candle. And the moment I saw the lights of the candle. Now this is where words don't work. But to describe divine things we have to use words. So I'm going to say some words now which are true, small t, but don't convey the fullness of the truth, but I have to use words. So I saw the flame, and I was instantly, um, what do you want to call it, I flooded in every way with all good things, light, love, peace, joy, Jesus. Wow, wow. praise the Lord. Sat down, heard the seven readings from salvation history, and then the gospel. And I just thought, oh, it's all true. It's all true. Jesus loves me. He died for me to set me free and forgive all my sins. He has risen from the dead to give me a new life. So I experienced the passion, death, and resurrection of Jesus, in Jesus, by the power of the liturgy. So when you go to the Mass, you experience all of this. So, this is very important. The only reason I had this dramatic experience was to exemplify what happens to all in the sacraments, and in the normal life of faith. So this is normative Catholic spirituality. It's nothing extraordinary. This is what happens in the history of the church. Sometimes certain things happen to certain people as an exemplar to all. St. Catherine of Siena had a mystical experience after many years of being in Christ where Jesus gave her a betrothal ring. Okay? Only she could see it. All that is is to give an icon of what happens to us all. We're all called to spousal union with God. It's mind-blowing. The church uses this language. Read the Song of Songs. Read the Song of Songs. God is a passionate, tremendous lover who was let down from heaven into the mire, into the deepest mire you could ever imagine of our sin to rescue you, at the same time taking all of that filth and cleansing and purifying <coughs> us and setting us free. So, so simple. Repent of your sins. 
fully, total confession. Believe in Jesus. The kingdom of heaven is very close to you. What does that mean for us as Catholics? The kingdom of heaven is so close to you that if you repent of your sins, believe in Jesus, he will entirely cleanse you, entirely of all sin. He'll take all the anguish away, which I went through. You don't need to do it. It's horrible. Don't do it. Take it all away. And immediately he will then fill you with all the fullness of the divine life. So that thing I experienced... You will receive sanctifying grace. You will be made a friend of God. The Holy Spirit will come to dwell within you. Jesus will come to dwell within you. And where the Son and the Spirit are, there the Father is also. We will make our home in you. You will become a dwelling place of the Holy Trinity. And then you set the world on fire. How does the life of fire grow within you? Through the Eucharist, you receive the body and blood of God. You receive the Eucharist and you go out from there breathing fire. That's what the father of the church said. Okay, it's so simple. Repent, believe, receive all the treasures of God which he gives you in the sacraments. It's so simple. So I tell people this and... Lovingly and joyfully and warmly and welcomingly. And then I just say to him, so get in the box. <laughs> okay? <laughs> so if you've never done it, what a treasure awaits you. Do a full, total confession. Receive the Eucharist. So for me, I'm nearly finished. So for me, after that experience, a couple of days later, I think it was a Tuesday, I went and did my first ever real confession. Maybe my second, probably the first one when I was a kid. And then after that, I repent. I just did what most people do and just said some nonsense about being fighting with my brothers and sisters, which I had. But that wasn't, you know, that, that wasn't the depth of my sin. So I did a full, to, total full confession, including, and you must do this, all the most embarrassing and vile and shameful things. Get them out there first. Don't hold anything back. If you hold anything back, you receive no forgiveness. You'll hear the words of absolution and nothing at all will happen. You'll actually get another mortal sin. Don't do it. It's a total waste of time. You waste your own time and you waste the priest's time. So don't do that either. Just be simple like a child. Confess your sins to the one who loves you. He will set you free. He will say, my child, I've been waiting all these years, decades, for you to come and do this. Thank you. I love you. Nothing gives me greater pleasure than doing this for you today. Ecstasy for Christ. Ecstasy for the priest when he sees somebody receive this gift. So, it's all true. Jesus says, this reminds me of being in Manchester. Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. If anyone believes in me, you will never die. Do you believe this? Potentis misericordiam invocatum.